capacity as the head of the Schomburg, I know the biggest difference leaving the academy to administrative work is money matters. Meaning that lots of people ask me to buy things or to approve things. So, Tom, you're just the right guy to be making the invitation for the future. Um, where's the, it's a beautiful day. Are you guys tired? Are you just, should we open the windows, get a breath of fresh air in here? Some enthusiasm. I want to, of course, thank uh, Dr. Morell and, of course, Dr. Erickson, uh, who have collaborated on this terrific series, Educating Harlem. Uh, when I looked at the lineup, uh, even though I'm oftentimes uh, too distracted by too many emails uh, pouring into my inbox all day long, to actually stop and take a look at the context in which I am participating. And uh, when I did take that moment, I thought, kudos to them, really terrific lineup of uh, topics and speakers, and I just, I felt even more honored to be asked to participate in it. So I want to thank you both again uh, for your hard work and your commitment um, to what you do here at Teachers College. And of course, uh, to the other faculty, uh, to the graduate students, many of whom I just spent some time with, uh, to the undergraduates and to a group of young men representing young historians who I had a chance to meet at the Schomburg Center. So. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, we talked a lot about what the Schomburg Center represents and the archive and the importance of the past. And um, I can see that uh, they are committed to this, uh, this program. So, Well, I understand that 5 o'clock is the uh, time at which my um, carriage turns into a pumpkin. So I won't belabor the introductions any longer and we'll kind of jump right into it. I just want to say if for those of you who have not experienced the Schomburg, either uh, as uh, a person just curious about the building and what's in it, uh, we have exhibitions all year long, usually about six in a year. Uh, and I strongly encourage you to go to our website, schomburg.org, to see what's on exhibition at any given time. You can also, at the website, sign up for an e-newsletter, which uh, updates our programming schedule every two weeks, lets you know what we're doing um, in terms of author conversations, performing performances that take place at the Schomburg, conferences, symposia. Uh, we do a lot of different things, and we are making the push to define ourselves as the premier cultural uh, venue, particularly for literary arts, um, uptown. Um, so Columbia, watch out. Uh, so please go to our website if you don't know the center, uh, take a look around and come to see us uh, physically. Finally, just a word about the history of the Schomburg. Uh, the Schomburg Center, as I said earlier to those I spoke to, uh, begins in 1926 uh, at a really heady moment in American history, particularly a moment that uh, sees the birth of this explosion of black writers and cultural producers. We know them as Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes, as County Cullen and Claude McKay, uh, but there's so many more. And the library became ground zero for uh, a source of information, a source of knowledge and inspiration to those artists and authors. Its founder, Arturo Schomburg, was a bibliophile who'd spent 30 years in New York City uh, after having arrived from Puerto Rico collecting any material by or about people of African descent. And those 5,000 items became part of the original collection. Uh, they are still with us. That collection is now 10 million items. Uh, and the birthplace of the Schomburg Center begins as a collection in the Branch Library in 1926. Um, that also happens to be a moment when Black History Week is founded by Carter G. Woodson, who was the first uh, Harvard-trained black historian who went on later to found the first professional academic journal dedicated to black history known as the Journal of Negro History and founds a professional society, the Association for the Study of Life in African American History, which will celebrate its centennial in 1915. I'll say a word or two about Carter G. Woodson in a moment, but I wanted you to have a context for both the center and the larger arc of this talk. Grand simplification historical illiteracy in the age of mass incarceration. Lewis Laffham wrote in Harper's Magazine in September of 2011 in an article titled, Ignorance of Things Past. 
Laugham, as some of you may know, was the long-term editor of Harper's Magazine, um, was responding to a series of signposts of the state of historical literacy in our country. And he noticed in a couple of conversations based on expert, experts citing uh, how much young people were aware of American history that there is an increasingly illiterate populace, I quote him, to be as poorly informed about American history as they are about ancient Egypt or modern Uzbekistan. 76% of college graduates are unfamiliar with the Bill of Rights. 73% of respondents unable to identify America's antagonist during the four decades of the Cold War. He says that Americans have a wonderful talent for grand simplification, this way of not only ignoring the past or erasing the complexity of the past or ensuring that certain historical narratives don't get passed on from one generation to the next so as to simplify what remains of history education, what remains of what we do teach our young people. He says that this grand simplification is a reflection of a process that is articulated in this way. Why argue for uses of history other than ones that sponsor the election campaigns, blow the bubbles on Wall Street, underwrite the nation's wars? In other words, for Latham, history is in fact with us, but only in its most simplified form, sponsoring the latest chapter in American exceptionalism, ignorance of things past, underwritten and co-signed by this practice of grand simplification. Turns out the Latham wasn't the first to call attention to the way in which we communicate information about the past without a commitment to a deep wrestling with what the past actually represents. That in its complexity is not the certainty of truth, but in fact the certainty of uncertainty. That in fact we cannot fully grasp all of what happened in the past, but in that search for something, we are committed to the past, committed to teaching and learning and educating about the past. Carter G. Woodson described in his most famously read work published in 1933, The Miseducation of the Negro, that the mere imparting of information is not education. The mere imparting of information is not education. He went on to say in a context where the challenges of legal segregation known to us today as Jim Crow were shaping and limiting the life chances of most African Americans co-signed by parables of black inferiority or the natural separation of the races. He said in response to this distinction between information and education that only by careful, careful study of the Negro himself and the life which he is forced to lead can we arrive at the proper procedure in this crisis. And of course, in a moment where I am coupling the terms grand simplification and an age of mass incarceration, this calls us to a moment to reflect upon what kinds of information do we know about how we came to exist in this moment, a moment defined by one scholar as an era of the new Jim Crow. In fact, we also live in an information age. We live in an age of big data, an age where at the touch of our fingers across Gorilla Glass, we can access the world's store of knowledge in just the blink of an eye. And oftentimes, this access and this ability to find the answer. How many of you, for example, have resolved a debate with a partner or a spouse or a child by saying, we don't have to argue about this. We can just look it up. 
What do we lose in that moment? What is the purpose of arguing? What is the purpose of the source of our use of our imagination to try to answer questions when we don't have the evidence right before our eyes? There is something about our humanity. There is something about where the way we are wired at this stage of our evolution that actually that process of arguing in the absence of something resolvable by a Google search reminds us that we are, in fact, human beings. Part of being a human being is to search for answers using our cognitive ability, not just having someone force information in front of us. In fact, knowledge emerges at the intersection of information and study and reflection and critique and debate and, of course, doubt. But, of course, I don't have to tell a room full of the learned full of those who uh, have spent many years dedicated to building expertise or teaching others how to do so. But occasionally, we just need a kind of reminder, a collective acknowledgment, like going to church on Sunday or synagogue on Saturday, that this need for doubt is critical to actually leaving open the possibility that we don't, in fact, know everything that we think we do. In fact. To be knowledgeable, one must always assume there is the unknown and the unknowable. And that distinction is also an important moment in an era of big data. Because what big data tells us is that because we can produce so much information, because our computer chips have gotten so small, razor thin, soon they'll be sitting right underneath our, the, the most outer layers of our skin, and we'll walk through stores, and they'll tell us what we need, and there'll be some kind of Terminator-like screen that pops up on our eyelids. And it would be much more efficient going to the grocery store. I don't know about you, but I hate going to the grocery store. I actually might welcome that change. But this problem of unknowability, like what does it mean not to be able to answer something? In fact, one could argue that that is where art and imagination speak truth, where certain forms of data cannot. And I know for my art education people here, that is precisely where art and learning takes place, this space of imagination. It turns out, actually, and I apologize, I've gotten so far into the talk that I have some help here for you all. Now, where is the, oh boy, hold on a second. It should be, yes. OK. I forgot there was a slide that you could follow along. You would know then that I was moving towards statistics. So this, this issue of big data, this relationship between the knowable and the unknowable, this need to create a space for our humanity that reflects upon the past and its messiness. Because the project of simplification is a project of reaching a form of truth that elides or masks the complexity, the social forces. And there is no more powerful and more dominant form of communication in our information age, in our big data age, than the language of statistics. Statistics has become the most communicative and most efficient way to make certain truth claims about the world we live in, who we are, and what has happened to us. And in that process, we mask important and complex social factors. It turns out that statistics on everything from population growth to health disparities to the constant drumbeat of polling data in our unending election cycles surround our information age and our contemporary media culture. We cannot begin conversations without citing statistics. I did so, even in mentioning the evidence of what young people don't know about American history. And yet, and still, statistics on race are even more prominent in the way in which we communicate this age-old problem of the presence of people of African descent in this United States of America. I would argue that statistics on race are particularly prominent among those of us in this room who have self-selected us 
ourselves into a conversation of interest to us because of the work that we do or we plan to do. So for example, if I were to cite the number of babies born out of what like as a category for making certain truth claims about where we are in this long journey called race in America, the percentage of fourth graders who aren't reading at grade level, the proportion of black high school dropouts, the numbers of people in prison, the number of them who are black or brown, the ratio of those born today who will go to prison in their lifetimes, even as I deliberately fail to mention the statistics, many of you already know the numbers in your head. And as I say those categories, those forms of communicating racial knowledge in our big data age, you've already answered the question. You've already said, oh, that's, yeah, that's 70 percent, right? Yeah, that's it. And one in three born today, black or brown, will end up in prison. It's like a roll call of data, a litany of facts, as it turns out, in this case, in this instance, about black people's humanity. It's a way of simplifying both their present, their past, and their future. These predictive assessments based on what we know using large data sets tied to census information or uniform crime reports or social survey reports or latest Gallup readings. And in fact, we often hear in this litany of data something that people say to resolve a messy conversation. Well, the numbers speak for themselves as if to say the interpretation itself is not a form of knowledge or imagination, or that the stakes, in fact, aren't about the why, when, in fact, they really are always about the why. How did this come to be? How did we get here? We hear very little in a conversation, for example, in a universe shaped by policies such as stop, question, and frisk about the why. If, if the mayor and the police commissioner are so right about the lives that have been saved as a result of this policy, this, this form of apartheid in the 21st century, this way of, of assigning presumptive guilt to whole categories of people as an inherent threat to the public safety of our fair city, you never hear the answer of how did this come to be? Why are those communities so dominated by crime and violence? Why do we need to turn to a punitive response in order to deal with the apparent and statistically sound evidence and facts of the pain and suffering and the bad behavior that happens in those communities? In fact, we've moved in just the opposite direction. We don't ask a question of why the same zip codes in 2013 are essentially the same zip codes in 1975, and in some instances, the same zip codes in 1945, and the same zip codes in 1925, where high rates of crime exist. We don't really ask those questions because it destabilizes our sense of certainty in the simple narratives that America has moved on, that this is about progress, that people rise and fall by their own merits, and the past has nothing to do with it, and especially not a past rooted in a kind of Jim Crow narrative of racist police violence. In fact, the predictive value of this form of big data, of this form of information, has moved into high gear in such a way that there's a man in Pennsylvania, a man named Richard Burke, profiled in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine not too long ago as the name, the Misfortune Teller. And as the Misfortune Teller, he has become the nation's leading expert on risk assessment in the criminal justice arena, compiling all the life history data on individual offenders, matched to macro socioeconomic data on where they come from, what kind of education they receive, the SES report on average income and poverty and employment rates, to say that these individuals, according to the misfortune teller to the Pennsylvania superintendent of corrections, should not be allowed certain kinds of programming. First of all, the programming is expensive, and these people, we predict, will recidivate again. And therefore, you get to save money because you don't waste it on people who've already, based on this predictive risk assessment, are more likely to reoffend. We can focus on those who our predictive models tell us that we should not, will not reoffend. And somehow, this is okay. Because in this simplicity, in the way in which 
this form of communication, this statistical assessment of people's humanity, makes it easier to make the tough Provost James decisions about how to use resources. And so when it's all laid out before us in a regression analysis and a statistics, it's not about people's humanity. It's about resources. It's not about a messy past that many of us would like to forget and move on from. It's about a contemporary moment. It's about a present that's really about just simply saving lives, never mind the fact that there's no good evidence that that's true either. But yet, that's what passes as a form of literate and informed engagement. That is not education. That is not our responsibility to be historically literate in grounding the sanity and the sanctity of human life in our society. We have traded on art and imagination. We have traded on our awareness of problematizing the interpretation of data for the data itself. But this is not just a New York City problem attached to policies like stop, question, and frisk. This is not a Pennsylvania state problem for the University of Pennsylvania researcher Richard Burke. This is not even a David Brooks problem who wrote in a recent editorial or op-ed in the New York Times called The Killing Chain, where in an essay about gun control debate said, it's really not about guns. It's about the policing. We need more policing. Let's not worry about guns. It's really in a broader sense that we have collectively given over to the parables of progress at the expense of the challenges of tragedy. In the language of James Baldwin, who wrote so acerbically and poignantly as a profound critic of the contradictions of the American story told and told generation after generation of itself, that progress was the primary driver of what America stood for. And that when the past gets away of telling that story of progress, when the past is no longer suitable, when it becomes a benchmark of moving backwards rather than forward, Americans have simply discarded, throw it out like the trash. Baldwin, in all of his essays, talked about the centrality and the importance of both acknowledging the beautiful and the ugly. Well, what of the ugly in our contemporary moment for the historical illiteracy in an age of mass incarceration? First, what are we teaching when it comes to a history of race in this country? If we know the statistics on race, a contemporary way, a shorthand way of defining black people's humanity, in many cases as a form of dysfunction or a form of public safety threat, we could ask the question, let's step back. What is the state of historical literacy in the nation? Well, Latham offers us one window into this, and I will only give you a few signposts. In fact, I'm sure and I hope that some of you as historians, those who are in the history and education program, are documenting and paying close attention. But since we all are learned, let me just mention a few. We know, of course, that in this moment for the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, one of the first moments to be attuned to the kinds of historical narratives that would pass in our, in our major political circles, first started with Bob McDonald signing off on Confederate History Month in April of 2009 and leaving out, of course, any mention of slavery as if the Confederacy could exist without slavery, came in to national view, a bit of scrutiny. He apologized, good for Bob, wants to be president one day. And in the next instance, his counterpart, the governor of Mississippi, Haley Barber, in responding to the controversy, said of this discussion about slavery that it didn't amount to diddly because we all know that slavery was wrong. But there's something about the simplicity of that that is both compelling and deeply troubling. Because the truth is, we don't all know that slavery was wrong. We may have a sense, and we may know that it's appropriate to articulate such, but the simple knowledge of it, it would be the equivalent of saying that in every community where there is a critical mass of a Jewish population, that there's no longer need for Jewish community centers. 
that we all know the Holocaust is. That's precisely the opposite of the importance of grounding the past as a form of knowledge and vigilance that history might be a guide to a better future. What is it about America's slavery past, for example, that calls us to this constant need to forget as opposed to remember and to learn from? We know, for example, new narratives of inclusion rooted in communities of Latino heritage have been subject to a kind of whitewashing, a kind of deliberate policy-based forgetting. First in Texas, in the rewriting of the standards for the Texas state books, I'm sorry, textbooks, essentially saying that there's been too much attention paid to social movements and, and civil rights activists and the empowerment of people at the bottom at the expense of those who helped to make America great. As a side note, of course, uh, the Republican-dominated state legislature setting curriculum goes, uh, guidelines in Texas also didn't care much for Thomas Jefferson, who somehow in his professions of the Enlightenment seemed to be arguing against the fundamental grounding of America as a Christian nation. You see, left simply to the status quo, the desire and willingness to simplify or to erase or to elide the complexity of the past is our historical practice and pattern. Therefore, one must actually be vigilant against, and I would argue we've slid for a long time in the opposite direction. Of course, in Arizona right now, it's illegal to teach La Raza or ethnic studies. In the language, and here I find it most and deeply troubling in a conversation about the relationship of historical literacy illiteracy about race in this country and the contemporary crisis impacting black and brown folk in this country. There, they say that teaching pride of race is anti-American. Think about that. Again, in a simple media and political discourse, this passes through the ears of many hardworking, real Americans as actually smart. That's right. Why would we teach in this day and age pride of race, and yet if you lined up all of those people and took them on one big gigantic field trip, chances are they would end up in a cultural institution, a museum, an art gallery, and oh, by the way, in nine out of 10 cases, that's just speak for a majority of cases, they would see traditions of European heritage and Western civilization, ways of honoring, acknowledging, celebrating, and remembering those who have left the world with works of art with terrifically beautiful and elegant ideas. And there's nothing wrong with that. But isn't that a form of the pride of race? Now here, a room full of very smart folks grounded in critical race theory. I don't need to belabor the point. But sometimes it's important to point out the obvious and the ways in which we committed to historical literacy in our classrooms and the work that we do and the spaces that we inhabit must be vigilant about the stories we tell and the way in which we do not become prisoners of simply communicating information, but in fact reclaim the responsibility of interpretation. We must tell stories. Teaching the movement perhaps is the most disturbing of these trends. Many of you may know that the Southern Poverty Law Center commissioned a study a couple of years ago where it sampled all 50 states based on their curricular requirements to teach civil rights history. Just by a show of hands, so I don't have to belabor the details if most of you know the study. Okay, fine. If you're being shy, that's okay. So, in this report, studied 50 state curriculums, they asked a simple question. What of the civil rights movement do you teach and how extensive is this engagement? They ranked the state curriculum requirements on a letter grade A to F. They gave a raw score of a passing grade, and I love this for the students in the room. This is the best kind of curve you could ever ask for. 16% was a passing grade, 70% was an A. To receive a passing grade, one had to at least acknowledge that, that a Baptist preacher once gave a speech on the Washington Mall. And it was a beautiful speech, and it talked about black children holding hands with white children. And 
um, was very aspirational in the parts, of course, that we sound by in the I Have a Dream speech. The other parts of the speech about the urgency of now and police brutality, not so much. And of course, maybe a mention of uh, that tired lady that, that you know, just happened to sit down one day. She just, was just too tired to stand any longer. Yeah, Rosa Parks. Yeah. If you mention those two people, you get a passing grade. But to get an A, you had to talk about Bob Moses and, and the work of educating sharecroppers in Mississippi to the challenges and to the history of their place. You had to talk about Marion King, who worked alongside Shirley and Charles Sherrod when they were teenagers in Albany, Georgia, where they lost a major battle in the civil rights movement on their way to the Children's Crusade in Birmingham. You had to talk about Ella Baker, who spent most of her life in New York City as the field organizer for the NAACP, opening branches all across the, across the 1940s South and then went on to be the godmother of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. You had to mix it up a little bit, and then you had to talk about all those divisions, right? Because all these civil rights leaders weren't holding hands singing Kumbaya, but in fact, in their own gendered and generational ways, were often working at cross purposes with each other, wanting to take credit for things that lost sight of the big picture, that some happened to be socialists and communists, some integrationists and nationalists. Well, that tells a different kind of story about the movement. That gets you closer to an A. Well, here's the news. They found out, once they did all of this, that three states got an A, 35 states got an F, and of the 35 states, 19 required no teaching of any civil rights history. Zero, zilch, nada. Now, of course, that doesn't deny that any number of teachers working in any school within that state doesn't mean they didn't do something on Martin Luther King Day or Black History Month, but it also means they weren't required to do so. It wasn't important to building those young people up in our civic culture to be informed about the past. It wasn't critical to their humanity, their citizenship, or their notion of democracy, especially in a nation so proudly boastful of having elected the first time the black, a black president, and now a second time. that somehow in his own evocation of Stonewall, I'm sorry, Sel what is it, uh, Seneca, Selma, and Stonewall, this soundbite version of our heroic past, this form of American exceptionalism that we don't even know why any of those movements were important. Why did it even matter? It's all an abstraction in an increasingly historically illiterate country. Well, Martin Luther King once talked about this, and I say this because this, again, is a version of King that we never hear. And I just, for someone committed to this work of historical literacy and to calling attention to those who are already doing this work and to providing a little bit of fire, I don't get to often talk to people who do this work, either as researchers or as people working with young people. But when I am talking to those outside of spaces like this, I remind them that the king's mission was, in fact, to expose the way in which the lies about the past or the evasions of the past were, in fact, operating in a way that made possible the continuation of repression. He said, in Where Do We Go From Here, the history books which have been almost completely ignored, I'm sorry, the history books which have almost completely ignored the contribution of the Negro in American history have only served to intensify the Negro sense of worthlessness and to augment the anachronistic doctrine of white supremacy. Think about that. For Dr. King in 1967, and where do we go from here, he is saying that what is in our history books is not just an unfortunate omission in what we teach, that it is a factor, it is a force in the problem of how black children identify and how white children identify. On one hand, a sense of worthlessness. On another hand, a false sense of superiority. That's a lot at stake for history. Well, let me suggest then that the crisis of historical illiteracy is a factor in our age of mass incarceration and as further evidenced by what some of our most successful in society offer as advice to young people on the road to individual success, which is to say this. 
that if we know race is still a source of tragedy in our nation, both past and present, if we know that the past itself is subject to forms of simplification for the purposes of co-signing the status quo, what we didn't really appreciate until recently was how important the notion of black exceptionalism is. What do talented, successful black people say to each other about how to move ahead in America? Because this isn't just a Republican legislative problem. This isn't just a red state problem. In a recent study written by Ellis Coast, a former journalist uh, and author of several books, including Rage of a Privileged Class, published in the mid-1990s, wrote recently in, book, in a book called The End of Anger. This is a study surveying the attitudes of highly successful African Americans represented by being the alumni of Harvard University's MBA program, as well as graduates of A Better Chance. And he looked at multiple generations of these young people, these people from 60-somethings to 40-somethings to 20-somethings, all of whom are doing very well and have had privileged educations in American society. Well, at the end of this study, he asked, he wrote in an addendum based on asking the Harvard MBAs, give young people the top 10 rules of success. What would you say to a group of young people about how to get ahead in America today? What are the important principles to guide your work and your future contributions to society. Here are the top 10 rules excerpted to four. Rule number one, you can only go so far as your networks will take you. Rule number four, embrace self-discipline and perseverance as virtues. These sound like terrific advice. I'm sure we give them to our students at various points. Cultivate people who are more powerful and important than yourself. And then rule number 10, never talk about race or gender if you can avoid it, other than to declare that race or gender does not matter. So if race or gender does not matter to our most talented and successful, why would a history of race or gender matter? It would be a distraction on the road to success. In fact, it's not just a distraction, but Pew did a study in 2007 one of its frequent ways of asking black people, who are the thought leaders in your community? What are the issues that motivate you? Well, they wanted to know what young people thought of the relationship of racial inequality and how you achieve or close the racial inequality gap. So in 2007, and this is to speak to the messages that we give young people who are historically illiterate, particularly about the history of race in this country. This is to the question of why blacks can't get ahead. Is it a lack of responsibility for their own condition or discrimination? More than half answered that it was their own lack of responsibility. And young people were more likely than older African Americans to answer it that way. No structural analysis. Because after all, that's what history is. History is not the sum total of individuals moving like atoms in a space, bouncing off of one another. It is a history of society, of in the old 19th century way of civilization. To study history is to see those structural forces moving in relation to individuals who are both product of that context and those who help to bring forth new contexts. We must reclaim both the past as a form of historical literacy and the importance of storytelling. Because after all, that is what history reduces to. So what do we say about the story of mass incarceration? What is it that we tell ourselves, how did we get here? And I know that some of you have to leave, so I'm going to move through this part of the talk faster than I would like to, but I want to highlight a few things. The first thing that we tell ourselves in our contemporary moment that these 2.3 million people, to cite statistics, 
descriptive statistics of how many people are behind bars, or seven million under correctional supervision, too many. We start by telling ourselves that this is a consequence generally of bad behavior. And we could, we could have a debate about whether that behavior should be criminalized or should be medicalized, whether drug addiction itself is a product of health or is a product of behavioral choice that people simply, out of volition, choose to do bad things to themselves and, in the consequence, hurt others. It essentially reduces to an issue of personal responsibility with a patina of policy concern about whether the war on drugs has just simply gone too far, and maybe it's just too expensive to lock up all these people. But there's nothing in this debate or this conversation that calls us to a set of ideas, ideas not rooted in a simple cost-benefit analysis, but in fact, ideas deeply rooted in the very nature of our racial democracy, deeply rooted in the very moment where black people no longer enslaved as free people experienced criminalization at the very beginning. There is no moment in US history since the end of slavery, and I don't want to sound like a crazy person to make this point, when black people were not criminalized or stigmatized as a race of dangerous people. It is simply true. It starts at the earliest moment with the black codes, which were ruled unconstitutional a year after they began, but essentially criminalized every form of the ways in which black people interpreted the end of the Civil War to mean, I want to own property. I want to constitute my family. I want to dictate the terms of how I sell my labor uh, to another. And at every stage of that pursuit of freedom for black people, closing the gap between the actual literal stepping away from a plantation to claiming one's humanity was subject to criminalization. The, the easiest one to mention here in the interest of time were vagrancy laws, which were a very old practice of criminalizing poverty all around the world. But in this particular context, for four million newly freed, formerly enslaved people, the context in which vagrancy laws became popular in this moment was the movement of enslaved people from one plantation to another, usually preceded by a disagreement over the fruits of one's sharecropping agreement. And so as black people were cheated and exploited, subject to violence or subterfuge, walked away in some instances, fault or physically challenged landowners and others, they were immediately criminalized by becoming vagrants subject to. Now, every single person who walked away from an agreement was not sent to a prison farm or to a convict lease agreement, which, by the way, in the South, there were very few prisons uh, because prisons have always cost money. It also posed the problem of putting black men in prison with white men, black women in prison with white women, because even in the newly constituted forms of white supremacy in this transformation of the South, it was an insult to share prison space for blacks and whites. And so we arrive at a moment immediately after the end of slavery where the ability to criminalize African Americans is tied directly to this new project of ensuring in a state of freedom that black people's labor would continue to be commodified by former slave owners. This project of the criminalization is well known to us. It's the story that Douglas Blackman tells in Slavery by Another Name. It's the story that leads to lynch mobs. It's the one that sees hooded Klansmen, even in an image of Django by Quentin Tarantino, and actually a pretty funny moment in the way that he talks about the Klan in 1858. It's constituted in 1866 when they don't really know how to use their hoods and somebody's wife cut the holes too close and they can't see. There is something actually brilliant about capturing that moment. But this familiar story produces artifacts. And this familiar story produces a social reality and what we call a political economy of punishment 
that produces statistical evidence of black criminality. But that statistical evidence, as it turns out, had to wait a little while. And the reason I say this is because, as it turns out, in the earliest days of this criminalization, this moment where black people were, in fact, never free from the burden of being assumed to be dangerous and their behavior being defined as criminal, was part of a longer set of ideas that articulated black people's humanity through the language, the lingua franca of 19th century race speak, which was scientific racism. The size of their brains, the color of their skin, uh, the odor of their bodies, the texture of their hair. And to extend that, the shape of their nose, the size of their buttocks, all of these physical, biologically rooted forms of assigning scientific evidence of racial difference as a proxy for racial inferiority preceded this moment. But the scientists, true to their form, were not able to agree. And therefore, they could not prove by their own standards that the differences between those of African ancestry and those of Euro European ancestry were greater than the differences between an Italian immigrant and an Irish immigrant, or a German immigrant and an English immigrant. And therefore, it destabilized in their own way of searching for that smoking gun of scientific evidence. And then came the Civil War, which only raised and intensified the stake of figuring out who are these people? Now we must abide them. Now we must abide them as ostensible equals in our political economy. And this is at the moment where such things like black codes become a way of not really having to solve the question. You just simply create an apartheid style system. You create a separate set of laws and to hell with the intellectual question. And yet the ideas mattered. And so as it turns out that as convict leasing is rolling along and black men who challenge white men over economic grievances or black men who shoot back at hooded Klansmen when they go to vote as Republicans and that's what the Klan was first committed to was keeping black Republicans from voting in the South. When they shot back and killed someone and had their day in court and no black person could sit on a jury and no black person could serve as a witness in their own defense and ended up, if they were lucky, to not be moved from a jail to a hangman's noose to actually serve time. All of that destabilization contribute to produce a larger and larger criminal justice system. And yet the reality, the reality of black criminality as told through tropes of, of crime and rape spreading across the South still was not convincing enough to a nation that had fought a civil war over the idea fundamentally that slavery was an abomination. Because those abolitionists had articulated another set of claims, both black and white, that black people shared in the common humanity of God, that they were, in fact, equal to whites. This is a short lecture on the context that precedes the moment when statistics on race congeal around a singular reality, and a reality that has become the most durable and dominating form of communicating racial difference in our society, which is crime statistics. Because the very first moment when crime statistics, this is a genealogy, the very first moment when crime statistics enter into a national debate about the presence the future, the progress, and the potential of black people in America coincides with the 1890 census. And the 1890 census is incredibly important because it is the first US census to represent a generational cohort of black folk that had never been enslaved. You all are social scientists to one degree or another, at least some of you. You know how important it is to have a control group. Well, this was the control group of the social scientists of that generation. These were the people that all those scientific racists had been waiting on. These were the people whose lives had not been shaped by the whip, had not been shaped by the lessons of civilization that beneficent masters often proudly boasted they had given to the benighted slave. This was a moment to see what was the stuff of black humanity? What were black people made of? They had not been touched by the institution of slavery and clearly in an America committed to parables of progress even in the 1870s. 
and 1880s. Black people were rising and falling by their own merits, so let's look at how they're doing. The 1890 census was a report card on the health and wellness of black folks who had never been enslaved, 25 years old from 1865 to 1890, a perfect generational cohort. And in addition to many things that were discovered in that U.S. census, that they actively look for. How many babies are born to black folks? How many people die? What kinds of diseases are they susceptible to? What is the disparity between their birth and death rates and their morbidity rates based on certain kinds of disease categories? All of these same ways of asking questions today to measure groups in our society were put in operation in this moment and put in a way that has been so long lasting because it's meant to resolve, to simplify complex reality. The one that has lasted the longest, the one that like the wiring in this room, born in that 1890 census like electricity in West Orange, New Jersey in the 1880s, if we are still prisoners of the late 19th century in the way that we illuminate literally our lives, so too is the consequences of this genealogical moment with the discovery that 30% of the nation's prisoners were black, and yet black people were only 12% of the nation's population. This was a simple, unimpeachable number speaks for itself, aha, moment to bring together those who had debated on both sides of the color line that finally we have proven that these people are unfit for the full fruits of freedom. And this moment of measuring black humanity and simplifying what? Now you thought all that stuff about convict leasing and chain gangs and clan violence was you know old stuff, but as it turns out, that political economy of punishment had everything to do with this statistical artifact, had everything to do with the production of those bodies trapped behind prison bars, and yet this number was not used to expose a racist or racialized criminal justice system. It was used to resolve the debate, to simply say, now we know. For liberals and conservatives, for northerners, and for Southerners, that black people have a special crime problem. And we ought to respond to them in distinctive and separate ways. That idea, that fundamental idea of defining separate, distinctive policies and practices is still with us tied to crime statistics, tied to simple calculations. We know there's crime there, therefore, we must behave in these particular ways. The story for us in an age of mass incarceration is also made more problematic by the fact that in the earliest form in which this number came to represent an entire framework, an infrastructure, shall we say, like the wiring in our buildings that is still with us, that this entire way of seeing things was also built on a relative argument between what the North was doing for these newly freed people and what the South was doing. So go back to this abolitionist idea that black people were capable of living up to the demands of society, that it was an abomination. Well, you'll have to take my word for it in the simple version of this, that this crime statistic threw much water on that lofty idea. But it was made more problematic, this idea that maybe black people should not enjoy the full fruits of their freedom by virtue of a comparison that, as it turns out, there were higher crime rates among black northerners than there were among black southerners in places like Chicago and Philadelphia, in precisely the places that shared a history of liberalism and abolitionism, places that saw themselves as committed to the future and industrialization and progress, didn't have time for the backward, regressive, agricultural, back to the farm, provincial ways that Southerners were still conducting themselves in the late 19th and early 20th century. So in these modern metropolises of opportunity, where, where big things were happening, the 
simple reality, the reflection that there were higher rates of crime happening in those cities, fed into this logic that, in fact, if black people are even more likely to engage in criminal activity in those cities, that it must be something wrong with them. And we liberals have no blood on our hands for what happened in the Jim Crow or newly Jim Crowing South. This ultimately contributed to something called the myth of Southern exceptionalism and the colorblind urban North. See, the argument here with our historical illiteracy, right, if we can't even teach something beyond Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King to our children, surely we're not going to teach them that the history of New York City is a history that is far more complicated when it comes to race relations, that there's a history of an unacknowledged Jim Crow in the city. And I know that Martha Biondi talked a lot about the post-World War II struggle for civil rights in this, in this city, in this city. But we have so much more work to do, so much more deep engagement with the relationship of this past and what we still tell ourselves when we think about racism in our criminal justice system. Somewhere between the war on drugs, which is a contemporary debate about its origins, and this past, we skip over a place like the history of Chicago or Philadelphia or Detroit. It's only as if there were white people and European immigrants and there was nativism and xenophobia and yes, there were some abusive Irish cops and and that's it. We, we have no other stories. Either there were the gangsters of the 1920s and Prohibition and Al Capone, but this is not a story about black people. And when it becomes a story about black people in places like New York or Chicago and Philadelphia, it's a story that's fraught with the history of the 60s urban rebellions. It's a story that is fraught with, with these commodity riots that take place in these poor black ghettos. And there we seem to get stuck because we're not quite sure who to blame. And in the politics of civil rights backlash, most of the blame falls to the young people who were too impatient, to the black power radicals who were too boisterous and too militant, too committed to revolution for revolution's sake. And so therefore, we don't know this history. We don't know this relationship between the importance of the idea of black criminality at the very beginning and an infrastructure of evidence to constantly remind ourselves who the criminals are in our midst and to build policies to ensure that we would incapacitate them to one degree or another, force their hand to move in one way or another in our society. One of those who articulated this the best was a man named Frederick Hoffman, who published a book in 1896 called Race Traits and Tendencies of the American Negro. And what I want you to see in the top quote, and I'll read it very quickly, is one, that he's an actuarial at Prudential Insurance. He's in Newark, New Jersey. He's a former German immigrant, literally comes to this country as a young man, penniless. He's very ambitious. Um, but he styles himself in his work as free and clear of any bias attached to the recent events of American history. He's got no blood on his hands. His job is to report the facts, just the facts. And so as a good actuarial using predictive risk assessment, right, like Richard Burke at the University of Pennsylvania, right, this is when it's happening. This is the infrastructure that we live with today. Frederick Hoffman introduces yet another variable. So if it's not just that crime statistics simplify complex social realities or the political economy of punishment in the late 19th century South, that those 30% are clearly not people who are simply evildoers in our midst. And that the durability of that truth claim that this is a reflection of black people's inferiority is tied to these northern parables where freedom reigns and black people still do bad things. Now, Hoffman takes it even one step further. And he essentially makes the argument that based on crime statistics, we can actually measure whether liberal institutions are doing good work for black people. Are they effective or are black people recidivating? This is the world where the, the term recidivism doesn't even exist in this moment, and yet the recidivist notion, the idea that whether we help people or we don't help people based on their crime statistics, is operating in Frederick Hoffman's logic. He writes, I have given the statistics of the general progress of the race and religion and education 
for the country at large and have shown that in church and school, the number of attending members or pupils is constantly increasing. But in the statistics of crime and the data of illegitimacy, throwing black women under the bus, just the same, not unlike today, the proof is furnished that neither religion nor education has influenced to an appreciable degree the moral progress of the race. Translation, in 1896, six years after the first census to put in national circulation evidence of black people's inferiority, resolving an old abolitionist pro-slavery debate rooted in destabilized racial science, now we not only have evidence to prove their inferiority, but now we shouldn't even help them. Because with all their new schools that they've built across the South, they seem to be impervious from moral progress. Now, Hoffman, to make the point that this is such a compelling way of measuring black people's humanity, of making certain policy decisions about the kind of life black people should lead in America, at the very beginning, Hoffman is our northerner. He is also our progressive, because Hoffman went to great lengths to make a case, case for reading and interpreting class or crime statistics amongst European immigrants as evidence of class inequality. It is a stunning double standard. We know, of course, and teaching the movement was studying Brown versus Board of Education and studying Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston, you know, these heroic figures, even when it's being taught, they opened up the schools and desegregated. But think about what abetted the process of segregation in the first place. What abetted the process of double standards and how we teach children born in this country, making it acceptable for sharecroppers' education for black children and first quality public education for white children in the South, but for citing crime statistics at the turn of the 20th century is evidence that those who are more educated show up in our crime statistics more than others. And the evocation that in New England, as compared to the Black Belt, and of course New England is code word here for bastion of abolitionist and liberal sensibilities, if they are acting a fool in New England, clearly it's on them and not on us. This was a way of reconciling the North and the South, the liberal and conservatives, around this conundrum of black criminality that essentially made it less problematic that lynching was happening in the South, made it less problematic that rates of police violence, though not measured statistically in the early 20th century, were cited in every black newspaper as a ongoing challenge for black people to actually live up to the promises of equality in the North. I'm gonna close with a counterexample, which I have to show you um, because it brings us full circle to how this story is not told and the relationship of our own lack of appreciation for this history in relation to the crisis of mass incarceration. So we could stop the lecture at this point and simply say, this is a story of one chapter of the history of racism, a version of white supremacy that is not just a southern story, it is also a northern story. It's not just a rural story, it's an urban story. It's not just a story of convict leasing, it's a story of policing in our northern urban cities that produces the statistical artifact of higher rates of disproportionate black confinement. And that this early story is predicated on a set of ideas that help explain this age of mass incarceration today where we so comfortably turn to statistics to communicate all that we need to know about black people. We could stop there, okay? That's the summary. And yet, in this same and precise moment, in this exact same moment, evidence of high rates of crime and violence, and we're going to hold constant any claim that the statistics themselves were undiluted in the case of European immigrants, right? That, that somehow they were truthful and the ones against blacks were not. Not making that claim. Only to say that how interpreters, social scientists, Hoffman's colleagues looked at the same evidence as it pertained to the Irish or the Italian, ultimately said that high rates of violence among them is representative of class inequality, of in the ravages of industrialization, that it is evidence of the struggle and strain of living in modern society, and what should we do in response? We should not answer the call of the nativists or the eugenicists or the social Darwinists. We should not argue the call of those who would restrict the borders to these suffering people who we need to build our railroads and our canals and to raise up our skyscrapers. These people are the stuff of our civilization and we need them. 
This was the great era of industrialization, after all. In other words, those crime statistics became a call to action to actually help and to intervene in the lives of European immigrants. The statistics were read through just the opposite lens. And this is just a perfect example. Um, I use this example because it's just so illustrative of the double standard. Look in that image. It is the image of the white urban ghetto of the early 20th century. Everyone there wears white skin. And yet, the markers of their potential moral degeneracy, the markers of their unfitness for urban life, are almost identical to the same geography of inequality that we witness as we traverse even this fair city. You've got five kids in the frame. The appearance of a single mother. So many children, she can't control them. Her young boys are fighting in the street on the road to juvenile delinquency. We know she's poor because there are shingles missing from her home. She's also a washerwoman, a category of work, work almost singularly reserved for black women as the 20th century great migrations unfolded. And not unlike today, for women from the Caribbean and from Latin America continue to operate occupationally in our society. We also see evidence of police brutality on this street. There's a police officer carting away. Everything that we associate, the messiness of our, the context in which stop, question, and frisk resides is right here in this image. And yet the interpretation, the call to response is not punitive. It's not more policing. In fact, it's even more explicit than how criminals are made. We are not left to fill in the blanks for ourselves. It's not simple. It's not even the language of statistics. In the Hoffman version of this, the number would speak for itself. 30% of our nation's prisoners are black, over three times overrepresented. Clearly, something's wrong with them. Here, we learn in this moment, the language is, so long as there are bad tenements, sweatshops, brutal policemen, bad jails, child labor, dishonest and grinding employers, saloons and gambling dens, so long as boys are taught to carry firearms. I'm going to try to move this. Um, thing to the left side. <sighs> ah. All right, well, I can't read the whole thing. And so long as boys are taught to carry, fight and allowed to carry firearms, so long as fathers are indifferent and deserters and mothers must maintain the house by the washboard. I just happened to remember that. And it ends, so long crime will continue. What will you do to help this association to prevent it? And what's interesting about this is this Central Howard Association is in Chicago, and it's a prisoner reentry organization in our contemporary language. It was established to help men coming out of prison to reconnect with families, to reconstitute stable households. What will you do to help to prevent this association? This is the double standard that the NAACP, under the pen of Du Bois, brought our attention to. Oh, boy, I can't get the thing to move. Okay. In this 1913 cartoon, American Logic, and here we see on the left side, I like to say that in this case, this is an example of sagging for the early 20th century. So the guy in each case on the right is meant to be our sagger. He's meant to be the, the potential suspect in our midst um, whose uh, choice of dress is both evidence of his class difference as well as his uh, moral suspicion. And yet, the American logic as articulated here is that the guy on the left, this man is not responsible for this man, even if they do belong to the same rates. And on the right, this man is responsible for all that this man does because they belong to the same race. This is the racialization of criminality. This is the way of drawing together blackness as a metaphor for criminality, tied and attached to the statistical evidence. Um, and I'm skipping around here in the interest of time. This is the penultimate slide. So in this case, we hear from Hoffman the way in which he compares the problem of Irish criminality or Italian criminality against African-American criminality. 
The Irish and the Italians show a percentage of arrests decidedly above the average, yet small when compared with that of the colored element. The point is that these people are causing problems in our society, but we are not going to worry about their criminality in this way. And in fact, people like Jane Addams, who you've seen flash across the screen, screen, represented a progressive response to build an infrastructure to respond to their humanity and to respond to the criminality for the purposes of helping. Du Bois calls out this uh, double standard both in the cartoon as well as in this quote. Murder may swagger, theft may rule, and prostitution flourish, and the nation gives but spasmodic, intermittent, and lukewarm attention. But let the murderer be black, or the thief brown, and the righteousness of indignation sweeps the world. It is blackness that is condemned and not crime. This is from an essay called Souls of White Folk in 1910. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem, the infrastructure, begins from the very start of freedom for African Americans. We are having the same debate. The Richard Burks of the world are continuing to make these false comparisons, continuing to make claims about what the data tell us and what we must do in response, when in fact the lesson here, the lesson that Du Bois called our attention to was that even if the data were irrefutably true, even if every statistical marker of black people doing bad things in their communities, committing property crimes, drug offenses, assault, robbery, homicide, even if we took an undiluted, unflinching assessment of all that is real and articulated by those statistics, it does not mean then that we abandon the cause of helping. Our policies today, you pick one, you name it, are fundamentally punitive because they are attached to these ideas rooted in this post bellum moment. What is possible for black people was built on this moment of divergent paths of the response to European immigrant criminality in our nation's cities as the call to action to help. The social Darwinists and eugenicists were the reactionaries of that time period who were defeated by the progressives, who went on to represent traditions in the New Deal state and in the post-World War II era of prosperity, building ever greater pathways for working class whites, now second, third, fourth generation European immigrants, to have a piece of the American dream, underwritten and partly co-signed by the suffering of African Americans. Conclusion. Past as prologue, and in this case, we most of us know of Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. We've seen the book. Um, I like when I saw the poster for this event, this image of black hands behind bars. And what's terribly important here in a lecture about historical illiteracy, about what we don't know, and in some ways, more importantly, what we don't make of the past. Because this is a story. I am bringing to your attention a story about the past to transform how we think and respond to our contemporary crisis. And so in this story, where we end, is precisely where members of the black press articulated the exact same problem that Michelle Alexander articulates in The New Jim Crow. Not because it's a story, an unending linear story about the war on drugs, but the relationship of states of unfreedom in our nation justified in a liberal context, having nothing to do with a social structure and everything to do with the pathologies of individuals and groups and their culture. I guess we're out of time in this room. This is an indication of that. Here we have an evocation of Du Bois's pioneering text, The Philadelphia Negro, published in 1899, which talked about the class dimensions of the black community as a way of pushing back against the racialization of black people, as a way to saying we have our aristocrats and we have our submerged tent. Therefore, the difference in outcomes, in behavior, has nothing to do with race. He was working that angle, even, even though it was fraught with certain kinds of moral claims about different groups of people. And so here in this image, we see a black man in the Philadelphia Tribune, a black weekly still published to this day, he wears the title Philadelphia Negro, evoking Du Bois's work, imprisoned not behind the bars of parental neglect or personal responsibility or pathology, 
but simply behind the bars of ill will, prejudice, segregated schools, Jim Crowism. And as Ben Franklin, the founder of this great nation and its commitments to liberty and freedom, looks perplexed back on his quote unquote city of brotherly love, reminds us that for 80 years we've been stuck in the same debate about what to do with black folk in this country. The European immigrant went from being a plural representation of many forms of criminality in our society to being an invisible presence in our political discourse as representatives of any kind of criminal class. In fact, the Uniform Crime Reports, at exactly the moment where this political cartoon was being produced in 1929, was being engineered to be, to this date, the most authoritative source of federal data on crime in the nation. If you Google big data era, if you Google with your phones right now, whether crime is rising or increasing in New York City, it will be the uniform crime reports that will be cited to give you evidence of that. And let me finish with this note. Before the Uniform Crime Reports began in 1930, if you looked at annual reports in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and you pulled out a crime re register, looking at arrest activity by offense, by group, you would see Albanians, Germans, Lithuanians, Slovakians, Russians, Polish, Mexican, Negro, white. The spreadsheet literally falls crumbling on your researcher's desk in an archive to this day. By 1930, white, Negro, other. The disappearance of the European immigrant was made possible by a separate or competing interpretation of what to make of the crime statistics. To move from a space of simplicity, a space where numbers speak for themselves to define people's humanity in relation to danger and threat, to move to a space of complexity that these people need our help, how criminals are made, what are the social forces working against them. Final lesson then, the legacies of grand simplification. That in fact the urban ghetto of our contemporary time, or I should say, let me, let me use the formulation that is there and move backwards, that mass incarceration is itself a product of our contemporary forms of quarantine, isolation, and containment of the urban ghetto with all the social forces implicit in that. And that the urban ghetto is itself, surprisingly enough, unbeknownst to most of us, a consequence of a statistical ghetto, a way of interpreting in a singular way black people's humanity through the lens of crime statistics in ways that did not hold true for any other group of people with the same durability and lasting effect as has been the case for African Americans. So the final lessons from all of this, not just that historical illiteracy has its role in our age of mass incarceration, not just to borrow what Martin Luther King said about what is not in our history books contributes to the Negro sense of worthlessness and the false doctrines of white supremacy. But in fact, that if we continue to use crime statistics as if we think they are not colorblind or that they are race neutral, that in fact that they don't communicate racial ideas and ideologies or that they have had not had any relationship to the shaping of the landscape of modern America, we continue to draw upon and use the same infrastructure that has been in place since the end of slavery. That in fact, crime statistics mask white crime and pathology. They reinforce black stigma, hypersegregation, and the policies of mass incarceration. And finally, for those who are, who like to use racial disparity data, this is that data that points out that say in 700,000 stops and frisks in 2011, roughly 86 or 88% was black, and that therefore that means Racism is happening. Well, most, I would argue most, but let's just say many, don't hear it the same way. When they hear 86% black and Latino stopped and frisked, they think that's where the criminals are. And so if the, those are the criminals in our midst, then of course good policing, good, hardworking, real American policing should go to where the criminals are. And so you cannot use racial disparity data without actually explaining what it means that it has a history, that there's a story to be told, that in fact the number does not speak for itself, even when you mean it.
in a liberal way. They have ultimately, these crime statistics, no inherent reform or liberatory potential for anti-racist scholarship or public policy making. Historical literacy, therefore, is fundamental to shaping knowledge and capturing the complexity of something in our contemporary moment. But we'll have to wait till the next lecture to see what that is. Thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm.